When should you consult neurosurgery to consider tapping a VP shunt? Well, there's pretty much two main indications for tapping a VP shunt, and that would be concern for shunt infection versus concern for shunt malfunction. Now, when we're talking about concern for shunt infection, one of the common consults they get is patient just has a history of a VP shunt and they're coming in with a fever. So is this a situation that actually warrants tapping the VP shunt? And in most cases, the answer is actually going to be no. So let's just quickly review the anatomy of a VP shunt. And so we have this device that's going into the ventricle and there's this little reservoir that can be accessed by neurosurgery. And then this drains all the CSF, usually down into the abdominal cavity or into the chest. And so when we ask them to tap it, what we're asking them to do is just take a little needle and uh, poke the reservoir, which is right on the scalp. It's very easily accessible. And then they can test the CSF to see if there's any signs of meningitis or shunt infection or something like that. But the thing to note here is that any time that you tap this area, it is putting the entire system at risk. And so it is not a benign procedure to do a VP shunt tap. And in fact, it actually is going to carry a high risk of actually introducing infection into the VP shunt, even if there was no infection to begin with. So this is one of the primary reasons that neurosurgery is so hesitant to tap VP shunts. And that's because if you actually introduce an infection into the VP shunt, it's actually gonna necessitate removal of the entire shunt. And then the patient is going to have to have an external ventricular drain place. They're gonna have to be hospitalized for this for several weeks, potentially waiting for all the infection to clear, and then eventually getting another VP shunt placed. So in general, if it's just a fever, we don't start off asking neurosurgery for a, a shunt tap right away. And what we need to do is actually rule out other infectious causes first. So there are much more common causes for fever, such as you know, viral URI or a UTI. These are much more common etiologies. So we're just gonna have to start off with our broad infectious workup before we going further into asking neurosurgery to tap a VP shunt. However, what if the patient is coming in with fever plus headache and neck pain? And that's leading us to have concern for possible meningitis. In that case, you know, should we just get the VP shunt tap? You know, it's right there, very easily accessible. Lumbar puncture would be uh, a little bit more hasslesome to obtain, and you know, we might not guarantee that we could get it. So why don't we just go for the very easily accessible part? So in this case, even if there is suspicion for meningitis we should go for an LP rather than tapping the VP shunt because of a couple of reasons. So number one is sometimes when we're evaluating for meningitis, encephalitis, we have to send off quite a bit of CSF and send quite a few studies. And VP shunt taps actually don't frequently allow you to get a ton of CSF out. And so sometimes you're not gonna have enough sample to send all the tests that you need to run. And secondly, this is probably even more important is that let's say you have concern for meningitis and you end up tapping the VP shunt but the patient does not end up having meningitis. Well, now you've basically put the entire VP shunt at risk for infection, basically for nothing because the patient didn't end up having meningitis. Whereas if you did the LP, you're not gonna be putting the VP shunt at as high of a risk for infection. And the other question that we sometimes have here is that uh, throughout medical school, we're told that you should avoid lumbar puncture if there's concern for increased intracranial pressure. And so this leads to people being concerned about doing lumbar punctures in these patients. Uh, VP shunts frequently being placed for hydrocephalus where there's this kind of increased intracranial pressure going on. But LPs are actually safe in these patients as long as there's no signs of increased intracranial pressure or any signs of shunt malfunction, like you see severely enlarged ventricles, ventriculomegaly on the CT scan. So LP is safe if no signs of shunt failure or increased intracranial pressure. The next point is that in general, VP shunt infections tend to happen very, very soon after they're placed. Uh, tend to happen within six months, maybe one year after placement. Or you can maybe be a little bit more concerned if there's been recent manipulation or things like that. But if somebody's had a VP shunt for multiple years and it has not been touched in a very long time, you should really lower your suspicion for a VP shunt infection. And then finally, what are some signs that can lead us to be a little bit more concerned for a VP shunt infection? So um, basically any signs of increased intracranial pressure are going to be signs that you know, would make you a little concerned. Generally, if these VP shunts get infected, they're gonna start having failure as well. So some suggestive symptoms that might give you a little bit lower of a threshold to call a neurosurgery would be things like headache, 
blurry vision, seizures, nausea, vomiting, altered mental status, and worsening hydrocephalus. And probably the most suggestive symptoms uh, would be if you're seeing actual localized uh, redness at the res reservoir or down the VP catheter. So redness at incision, poor wound healing, redness tracking down the catheter. Those are going to be much more suspicious for an potentially an isolated VP shunt infection. And that, those would be situations that neurosurgery would very likely tap that right away. So let me show you some signs on Google images of some infected VP shunts. So here's one which appears to be uh, probably near the reservoir. And you can see there's a bunch of redness. There looks like there's some pus there. And that's very concerning, right? Um, and then sometimes you can actually see redness tracking down the patient's catheter that's going into their abdominal cavity. So there's redness all the way, you know, all the way in their neck and then all the way down the abdomen. Those are all going to be signs of potential VP shunt infection. So again, just to strongly reiterate, if there is just an isolated fever with no other concerns for VP shunt infection, it hasn't been touched in a very long time, then most likely it's going to be some other alternative cause of fever. And we would not want to go tapping that VP shunt because you'd be putting it at risk of infection just by tapping it. So do the rest of the infectious workup first before calling neurosurgery. All right, now let's move on to concern for shunt malfunction. And from what I was reading, this actually tends to be more commonly what presents rather than shunt infection. And so shunt malfunction is usually going to be referring to potentially like a blockage that's causing the shunt to no longer adequately drain the CSF. And so what happens in these patients is they start to get worsening hydrocephalus or worsening signs of increased intracranial pressure. So consider if you see worsening hydrocephalus, uh, signs of increased intracranial pressure. And so what we typically are going to be getting here is you're going to need to get some imaging. So you can get this thing called the VP shunt series, which is just like one to two x-rays, very benign, and it might help you see if there's any kinks in the VP shunt um, catheter or anything that's causing that obstruction. But it's kind of limited. It's not going to give you like the most information. And so some people just recommend going straight to um, uh, CT or MRI. So consider just going straight for CT MRI because this is going to give you a much better look of the entire system and also is going to let you see if there's any signs of ventriculomegaly. So look for ventriculomegaly on the CT scan. The other thing to look out for is that some patients can develop this palpable abdominal mass, which is called an abdominal pseudo meningocele. So if you look at this, you can see um, you know, the VP shunt is here and then all the fluid can kind of get uh, accumulated here. And you can see it can be really quite pronounced in these patients and basically is causing this rapidly uh, enlarging abdominal mass. And that could be very suspicious of shunt malfunction. So generally, if there's concern for shunt malfunction, neurosurgery will tap it. And if the tap reveals little to no CSF, then that suggests a proximal obstruction. If there is an adequate amount of CSF, then that suggests a distal obstruction and that's gonna change their management. But generally, these patients are at risk for worsening hydrocephalus, uh, worsening uh, risk of brain herniation. Um, so these patients are gonna be taken to the OR for a revision of their shunt in order to relieve that obstruction. So risk of worsening hydrocephalus or brain herniation. In the emergency setting, uh, especially in areas where they don't have access to a neurosurgeon, they may actually temporize the VP shunt if they're pretty sure that there is malfunction because if it's gonna take a while for the um, patient to go to the OR for a revision or there's some transport time or there's just high concern for risk of herniation, they may just do a therapeutic tap to drain as much CSF as possible and stabilize them before they can get to neurosurgery. But anyways, that's basically the uh, basics of when you should call neurosurgery to consider tapping a VP shunt. I just want to make this quick video because I feel like this situation comes up uh, to hospitalists sometimes and we don't encounter patients with VP shunts a lot. Um, I think it seems more common in pediatric patients. But uh, when we see it, we don't really know what to do. We're not as familiar with the management of these. So uh, this is just something to help you know when you should be concerned, when you should contact them, and that just an isolated fever with a history of a VP shunt is not something that you automatically need to be or should be consulting neurosurgery for. So I hope that was useful. Let me know in the comments if you have any other thoughts about this or if you're a neurosurgeon and you want to correct me on anything I said. But I thought it was an interesting subject. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in the next video and peace.